What do you think of when you hear these phrases? When chickens have teeth. I swallowed some camels. Playing a zither to a cow? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Unless you know French, Norwegian, or Chinese, these phrases probably sounded a little strange. That's because each is an idiom that has been translated from its language literally, or word by word. An idiom is a saying or expression which uses specific combinations of words to mean something different than the individual words themselves. Idioms are a common and colorful feature of language, and experts estimate that anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of our everyday language use contains idioms. So how would you go about translating an idiom? Let's start with the first example. When chickens have teeth is an expression in French which refers to an unlikely event, like saying, that's never going to happen. If we translate it word by word, this meaning may be lost. That's why translators are often expected to go beyond word by word translation in order to translate the sense of an idiom for readers in the target language. Ideally, the goal should be to find an idiom in the target language that uses similar concepts in a similar structure to convey the same meaning. Sometimes this can be easier said than done to use another idiom. Luckily, in English, we have a phrase that also, one, uses an animal image, two, uses a similar structure starting with when, and three, means more or less the same thing. Can you guess it? Right, when pigs fly. Though when chickens have teeth doesn't mean very much in English, when pigs fly is widely familiar and also important, it's commonly used in English just as the original idiom is commonly used in French. One way I like to think about this is um, translating a joke. So if you translate a joke and you do a metaphrase or word by word approach, so all the words are in the right order. Um, uh, right meaning they're in the order that they were in the source text. It, there's a good chance that uh, it's not gonna quite be as funny. Uh, the punchline might be missing. Something just might be in the wrong order. The pacing or the rhythm might be off. Um, and the question then is, if it's not funny, then have you really translated a joke? It's similar with idioms. Oftentimes a translator has to go the extra mile and really think through how their word choices are conveying the sense and also the structure of the original idiom in an idiom, ideally, in the target language. Sometimes the choice of how to translate an idiom is quite a bit harder. Let's take the third example the Mandarin Chinese phrase which, if translated word by word, would be playing a zither to a cow. If you're reading a translation of a novel from Chinese and one of the characters says she is playing a zither to a cow, it would mean, roughly, that she's speaking to someone who doesn't understand her. It's a funny image. And some readers might be able to guess what the idiom might mean if translated word by word. But it's not fully clear. So how do we translate this? There's a few options. You could, one, keep playing a zither to a cow. Not the most artful solution, and many readers probably won't get it. Two, you could explain the idiom without translating it into an idiom in the target language. For example, she was speaking, but he couldn't understand her. Also not a very artful solution. Three, you could use a familiar idiom in English that conveys the sense, such as to fall on deaf ears or talking to a brick wall. For instance, she tried to explain, but her words fell on deaf ears. This conveys the sense of the original, but leaves out the comedic image of someone playing an instrument before an animal. Or, for, you could find a familiar saying in English that conveys some of the sense and keeps the animal imagery. For instance, the biblical phrase, casting pearls before swine, which means to waste something valuable on someone who doesn't appreciate it. This has a harsh connotation, 
but keeps the image of a person supposedly wasting something on an animal. Or you could do something else. What would you do? Obviously, it'd be great if there was an identical phrase in English for every single idiom in the world, but this simply isn't the case. It's up to the translator to find creative solutions. Translating idioms in literature is a fun challenge. It is one of my favorite things in literary translation. You come across interesting and colorful expressions in the source text, the text that you are translating, and you need to find ways to recreate these expressions, these idioms in your translation. One of the languages that I translate from is modern Greek. And I remember a short story by the Greek writer Nanos Valauritis, where there was a hilarious Greek idiom uh, involving chair legs. In other words, the legs uh, of the chair that we're sitting on, chair legs. Uh, so the Greek phrase, erichne kareklopodara. The literal translation, it was throwing chair legs. What, what can that mean? What, what was throwing chair legs, one would ask in English, the English reader, if, if that's what you put. Well, so if I'd done a literal translation or a metaphrase, it would have made no sense. Uh, so in Greek, when we say that it's throwing chair legs, it means that it is raining heavily, very heavily. The images of chair legs falling down. Just imagine really, really heavy rain falling from the sky. Well, in English, we have uh, the equally funny idiom, uh, it was raining cats and dogs. So that's what I used. It's raining cats and dogs, where you have cats, dogs, cats, dogs, a lot of rain. It's a funny, comical, equivalent idiom. Another challenge which translators often face is figuring out how to translate culture reams. A culture-reme is a culture-loaded word or expression that has a specific meaning to a particular culture. These words and phrases are notable because they contain cultural information. What does that mean? Well, for instance, take the name of a food dish like lo mein, guacamole, or paella. On the one hand, these are names of specific food dishes, yet they are also unique to a culture with specific cultural associations, rituals, and histories that are linked to the name. The Vietnamese dish pho, for example, has a very different cultural connotation than the Japanese dish udon, though one could technically translate both as simply noodle dish. Other common examples of culture reams include well-known place names, such as Times Square in New York or Tiananmen Square in Beijing, the name of a person, such as the Greek name Eleni, or the Spanish name Pedro, or a social situation that is particular to a culture, such as Thanksgiving dinner in the United States, or the Imoni festival in Japan, where communities celebrate the harvest season by eating from a single giant pot. As with idioms, it's crucial for a translator to give thought to the nuances involved with translating a culture into a target language. Let's look at an example. In the Spanish novel Don Quixote, there is a character named Don Pedro. Don is the Spanish word for Mr. or Lord. Pedro is the Spanish form of Peter. How would you refer to this character if you were translating the novel? Don Pedro? Mr. Pedro? Don Peter? Mr. Peter? Your answer may say a lot about how you view culture in and translation. Some translators prefer to keep names of people, places, or food intact in their translation, while others prefer to translate culture reams into recognizable contexts in the target language, or what is known as domestication, which we'll cover in our next lecture. Let's look at another example. The Spanish dish paella is relatively well known in America, but not very well known to everyone. Would you a. Keep the original word paella in your translation, or B. Translate it into something like rice dish, Spanish rice dish, or Spanish rice and vegetable dish. What if the dish was less well known in the target culture? These examples are to highlight that there's no one-size-fits-all solution when translating complicated passages. Rather, a translator should be adaptable, adopting different techniques for different solutions depending on the text, 
the audience, and other factors. What do you think? 